A few days ago, I asked an Indian friend to tell me something about how the COVID-19 pandemic is affecting her home country. As a response, she sent me a voice message on WhatsApp that was so touching, so informative, that I immediately asked her if I could share it publicly. She's not only an amazing storyteller, but she's an expert one, because she has worked as a public health official in India for six years, and she is now doing research work on the interaction between new medical technologies and social actors. What you're about to hear is the very voice message she sent me, and that I'm sharing with her permission, of course. She will remain anonymous, but this doesn't take anything away from her testimony. If you don't know much about how the pandemic is impacting the people of India, let my friend tell you. Good morning, Federica. I wanted to write to you or send you a short message on India. And I'm thinking where to begin. So, 1.3 billion population, extreme population density, especially in big cities like Mumbai and Delhi. Also, a lot of population lives in slum, where there is limited supply of drinking water. So, something like social distancing and hand washing is a luxury. It's almost a joke to tell these people to do this. And yes, though I'm critical of India and how it handled the situation, I also always remind myself that 1.3 billion population is a huge challenge. Also, this population is not necessarily highly educated. Not that education seems to have an impact, but you generally hope that people are more um, informed and have good understanding of risk factors if they are educated. Of course, the protests in Berlin kind of make you wonder about that as well. But hopefully even that's a very small minority of German population. So how did it evolve? First case from India was reported end of January in a state in the south called Kerala, which is far advanced in terms of social economic quality indicators. This state is also particular because they have the highest, I think they have 100% literacy rate in the state. It's a wealthy state. A lot of people from the state work abroad, so there is a lot of foreign money coming into the state. So better economy, higher education. And this state has had experience with Nipah virus outbreak, which is a virus spread through bats. So they had a bit better public health infrastructure, but also disease surveillance infrastructure. The first case was a medical student from Kerala who was studying in Wuhan. And they returned to India and they were tested positive. But since then, India was in a denial mode. So always the argument was we are not at risk. They closed international airports, I think somewhere around end of February. Or they didn't close the international airports. They had screening programs and screening was done by temperature measurement. There was a tremendous chaos at international airports. People gave wrong travel history, there were huge queues, so nobody had patience to wait for the screening procedures. They gave wrong information in terms of address and contact numbers, so nobody could be traced by the public health authorities. But generally, Indian authorities kept saying, we are doing great because we have this screening procedure at airport, where we all knew that this was a disaster and a fiasco. So we started reporting cases quite late. And initially, the number of cases reported were rather few because also the number of tests performed were extremely low. So almost till mid-April, the biggest argument of all public health experts was that we are not testing enough. I think now the testing has improved quite a bit over a period of time. But again, in the beginning, India was kind of denial in reluctant mode, saying, no, no, we test enough. And Always the numbers could be twisted in different ways to tell different story. And that's what our authorities did quite a bit. Central government, I am extremely critical of, but for many reasons, not just this pandemic. Uh, some states did better, like state where Mumbai is situated, the state in down South Kerala. They were more proactive. They were testing more. They were demanding more tests to be supplied by the center because it's always the center who buys the tests but they were not always given enough amount of tests because the idea or the fear always is if you test more, you report more. And if you report more, that's a problem. 
So testing now has improved quite a bit, but we also see large number of cases. So on an average for last two weeks, India has been reported between 72 to 75,000 cases a day. But again, for 1.3 billion population, this is not that huge a number. Interestingly, India has rather low mortality, and it's something that I cannot explain myself. I have been a public health specialist working in India for six years. It doesn't really make sense of the data, but also we must remember that we do not have systematic recording of deaths in India. So there are a lot of these international comparative studies where people have looked at the mortality rate in general population for the same period of time last year and comparing it to this year. And India is nowhere to be found there because we simply don't have that data. So 23rd of March, India went into this unprecedented countrywide lockdown, which a lot of people and foreigners found it really, really amazing that India could do something like that. I have a lot of problems with that approach because this lockdown was put in force with four hours notice to people. So those who were well to do, they could kind of fend themselves. They had roof on their head, they had money, they had food. But more than 40% of India's population is below poverty line and they depend on day-to-day -day work for having food on table or in their plates. And this was the population which was affected really badly because of these policies. So economic impact of it was huge. People living in cities and we have huge internal migration of labor from rural areas to big cities like Mumbai, Delhi, Chennai. These people without jobs in cities couldn't afford to stay in those little places in slums that they could rent. They had no food. They couldn't leave their homes. And there was uncertainty whether the life would begin again or how long this lockdown would start. So at some point in time, sometime in April, people started walking home because we shut down all the railway system, public transport. And people started walking home sometimes thousands of kilometers with young children, with elderly, without footwear. And this is the time of the year when India has extreme summer temperatures. So I have seen these heartbreaking images of people with barefoot walking on the tar roads with blisters on their feet, dehydrated, dropping dead because of dehydration and exhaustion, having cardiac arrests. Their agony and suffering, and it was all over the media with millions walking home, was just heartbreaking and this could have been easily avoided. At least people should have been given options to plan their journeys home. A lot of NGO sector and people started helping in this situation. They were collecting footwear, they were collecting clothing, water, food supplies along the highways. But number of people who died while walking home, we would probably never get that figure. There were also people who started walking home along the railway lines thinking that these are the shorter routes. And then they would get so tired and they would fall asleep along the railway lines because they believed there are no railways running. And at least about 20 people were run over by train while they were sleeping. And these were the goods trains which were still allowed to run. Again, heartbreaking images, heartbreaking stories. And this continued for about two to three weeks. And main support for these people came from the NGOs, not from the government. Simultaneously, different state governments started building shelters where these people could stay. They were given food. But again, I mean, nobody wants to just sit there, not having jobs and staying. I mean, the preference always was to go back to village with the loved ones. One public health aspect was that early disease was in the rich and the wealthy, especially those who had history of foreign travel, and they generally brought the disease to cities. The wealthy in the cities often have drivers, maids, servants, cooks, so that's how it went down to the lower socioeconomic strata. But then when this lower socioeconomic strata started walking home and going to the villages, we basically brought the virus from cities to the villages. Villages where there is no health infrastructure, there is no spare food or money to feed this returning population. Actually, the families in the villages often depend on the money coming from the cities. And there was absolutely no test infrastructure in these rural parts. So it was not always the case that the families back in villages were looking forward to having these men coming back from the cities. But on the other hand, in a slum of Mumbai, in an eight by eight foot place, if there are eight people, eight men living, how do you expect them to sit together in the scorching heat of summer 
maintain social distance. It was just a joke. I still can't believe. I mean, I don't know how as public health authorities or government we could tell people to maintain social distance. And generally the way these men work is that they work in shifts. So at a time, probably there are only two or three who use that space for sleeping. But now they all were basically together and literally nowhere to go because they were not even allowed to go out on the streets. So, for example, Seafront in Mumbai, which is the place where all rich and the poor can at least have access to fresh air in the evening, even that was not allowed for people. So then we started seeing a lot of cases of discrimination and stigma, especially for health workers who had already seen overwhelming of hospitals. A lot of healthcare staff got infected. There were problems with distribution of PPEs. But the worst was when they would come home in housing complexes and apartments, there was so much fear about they bringing the virus that they were ostracized, their families were ostracized. And then there had to be appeals telling people that, look, without these people, our hospitals would shut down. So please, at least don't harass their families. We also saw a lot of people committing suicides when they tested positive for Corona in the beginning of um, the pandemic. And that was also to do with stigma and fear that anyways, we are going to die. So we had cases of people jumping off the windows of hospitals or breaking open the windows of hospital toilets and using those glass shreds to cut their arteries. Very strange situation. And again, I felt we could have done better in terms of communicating, but I understand it's not so easy in a country as diverse in terms of socioeconomic structure, but also people's beliefs to communicate a consistent message. A lot of focus on Indian immunity. People believe that Indians are better immune than the rich Europeans, which was a joke. Then there was a belief that hot temperature in India makes the virus less infective and less harmful. Again, did not really turn out to be scientific fact. It was never a scientific fact. Indians were doing lots of Ayurvedic strange things, believing that this would um, improve their immunity. So messages circulating around this time were really, really disturbing, like drinking hot water kills viruses or drinking colostrum or medication made up of colostrum of cow's milk boosts your immunity. We had some local Ayurvedic, so-called Ayurvedic medical production houses who tried to sell some drugs in the name of protecting against Corona. People bought those kind of things because there was also desperation. We also had a problem of communal divide during this time because in Delhi there was an aggregation of a particular sect of Muslims from all over the world who were together and they were blamed for bringing the virus into the country and also spreading it to different parts of the country, which is not entirely true. But at the moment, the Hindu Muslim divide in India is so strong. It's also fueled by the right wing political power. It was again heartbreaking to see that, how Muslims were blamed for the virus. Fortunately, all the festivals, and India is full of festivals of all different religions, so all festivals were banned, all the temples were shut down because we also visit temples in huge numbers. And it was actually yesterday that they opened religious places of worship. Schools were shut down quite quickly. Home officing didn't really work out because most people did not have infrastructure at home to be able to work from home. But also a lot of administrative and government work happens still paper based. So they simply had no files to work with. Schools are still not opened. It's a bit uncertain what's going to happen, but a lot of focus on online education. But again, the problem is most people do not have access to computers and Internet, especially those from the lower socioeconomic strata. So we are seeing a lot of educational lag in these children, and this will have long term consequences. There is clearly more evidence of um, domestic violence. And that was obvious with the lockdown when everybody is forced to be inside and there is nowhere to go. I think in about a week or less, we would probably overtake Brazil, the way the number of cases in India are increasing. There doesn't seem to be the situation where we have even reached the first peak of our epidemic. International travel has still not been fully resumed. There are some air pockets. The countries on quarantine list are also often more based on the international relationship with the countries than epidemiological data. 
Yeah, that's the main thing I can think of. I hope this gives you some overview of what's happening. Yeah, bye-bye.